In 1995, physicist Edward Witten wrote his famous paper where he conjectured that all string theories are the limits of a single theory called M-theory. However, his work was in part motivated by a beautiful piece of work by an Indian physicist named Ashok Sen. Witten recalls that this work by Ashok Sen was central in changing his attitude towards the concept of dualities, which was a central concept in his M-theory paper. Moreover, when the first ever breakthrough prize in fundamental physics was awarded in 2012, Ashok Sen was one of the recipients. We gave this award to Ashok Sen. So who is Ashok Sen and what works did he do to become a major figure in modern theoretical physics? I am a theoretical physicist and in this video I will try to answer this question. Some parts of this video can be a bit technical but I will try to simplify things as much as I can. And which is sufficiently long lived, then multiverse seems to be an automatic consequence of that. And of course there are puzzles with black holes which are yet to be solved. And maybe those puzzles will not be solved but we'll discover something completely different and wonderful. Ashok Sen was born on 15th of July 1956 in the city of Kolkata, which is the capital of the Indian state named West Bengal. His father, Anil Kumar Sen, was a professor of physics at Scottish Church College and his mother was a housemaker. Sen was schooled in Sailendra Sarkar Vidyalaya, which is a government-sponsored school in North Kolkata. He did his bachelor's in science from Presidency College in 1975. At that time, Presidency College was a college under the University of Calcutta, but in 2010 it became a university. During his time at Presidency College, Sen had a teacher named Amal. Mal Kumar Rai Chaudhary. Rai Chaudhary was a physicist who was known for his work on general relativity and he came up with an equation that described the motion of bits of matter that are near each other. This equation is called the Rai Chaudhary equation but it was also discovered independently by Lev Landau. When Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose were proving their singularity theorems, the Rai Chaudhary equation was an important result that they used in their work. Ashok Sen was greatly inspired by Rai Chaudhary as he recalls later. Among the teachers, there was one very influential teacher. Professor Amol Kumar Rai Chaudhuri, who was also a uh, world-renowned scientist in general theory of relativity. And his teaching certainly influenced me a lot. After his bachelor's, Sen did his master's from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, and in 1978, he left for Stony Brook University to get his PhD where he started working under George Sturman. Sturman did his most notable work in the theory of strong interactions called quantum chromodynamics, or just QCD. In 2003, he was awarded the J.J. Sakurai Prize for his work in QCD. Another notable Indian physicist named Sunil Mukhi is also a student of George Sturman. In his PhD, Sen worked on problems involving quarks and photons. We will talk about one problem that he solved in his PhD. In special relativity, we talk about a four-dimensional momentum which is called the four momentum. The square of this four momentum should be equal to the square of the rest mass of the particle that carries the momentum. However, in quantum field theory, this relation can be violated. If this relation is satisfied, we say that the particle is on shell, otherwise the particle is off shell. This information will be useful later in the video. Now, Sen considered the probability of a quark interacting with electrical field. The technical jargon for what I am referring to as probability here is scattering amplitude. This process involves an incoming quark, an outgoing quark, and a photon. There are several different possibilities that contribute to this process and they are known as Feynman diagrams. Now, you can calculate the probability of this process happening and this probability can be written in terms of mass of the quarks, the four momentum of the photon, and the strength of the interaction between quarks and photons. This strength is called the coupling constant and it is denoted by G. Sen tried to account for all Feynman diagrams and calculated what this probability would look like if the momentum of the photon was very large. In order to calculate the probability of this process, you need to calculate a quantity called the form factor. Sen calculated this form factor for large photon momentum. In 1982, he wrote his PhD thesis titled Asymptotic Behavior of Feynman Amplitudes in Gauge Theory. In October 1982, Sen started his postdoc at Fermilab National Laboratory. Here he did a calculation similar to the calculation that he did in his PhD, but now for two incoming quarks and two outgoing quarks. 
However, this calculation was also done in the limit when the energy carried by the quarks was very high. He started his second postdoc position at Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, which is also known as SLAC. And after this postdoc in March 1988, he joined Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in India, which is commonly referred to as TIFR. Sen remained at TIFR until 1997, but in 1995, he joined another institution named Mehta Research Institute, or MRI. This institute was funded by a trust named BS Mehta Trust. Later in 2000, MRI was renamed to Harish Chandra Research Institute, or HRI, in honor of the Indian mathematician Harish Chandra Mehrotra. If you look at Sen's papers, he changed his affiliation to HRI even before he left TIFR in 1997. He remained at HRI until 2021, and in November 2021, he joined the International Center for Theoretical Sciences, which is often referred to as ICTS, and it is a part of TIFR. One of Sen's earliest contributions was regarding the heterotic string theory. In 1985, David Gross, Jeffrey Harvey, Emil Martinek, and Ryan Rome discovered two new string theories called the heterotic string theories. Like every string theory, the fields in heterotic string theory need to satisfy some equations called the equations of motion. Now, very often there are two available methods to study a string theory. One method is to study the fields in the total space-time in which the string moves. This total space-time is called the target space. The other method is to study the fields on the sheet that a string generates when it moves through space-time. This sheet is called the wall sheet of the string. The field theory that one studies on the wall sheet has to be a special kind of field theory called the conformal field theory. These theories have a special kind of symmetry called the conformal symmetry. In two papers, Sen showed that for heterotic string theory, the equations of motion in target space imply that the wall sheet theory is a conformal field theory. Later, similar results were found by Curtis Kalan, Daniel Fridan, Emil Martinek, and Malcolm Perry. In another paper, Sen worked out the kind of supersymmetry in the wall sheet theory that you need to get the minimal supersymmetry in space-time, which is also called the n equals 1 supersymmetry. n equals 1 supersymmetry is important because it is the only amount of supersymmetry that is relevant for getting the standard model out of string theory. The only other possibility that can give you the standard model is having no supersymmetry at all. This work contributed to getting Sen the ICTP prize in 1989 and the SS Bhatnagar prize in 1994. Around 1995, physicists Paul Townsend and Chris Hull and in another paper, physicist Edward Witten proposed the conjecture that if you compactify heterotic string theory on a six-dimensional donut, which is called T6, then it is related to the type 2 string theory if you compactify it on a special space called K3 times T2. The technical jargon for a donut shape is a torus. This is why a torus in n dimensions is called Tn. We will use the word torus from now on. Sen wrote three papers, one of which was written with Sayyid Fawad Hassan, where he developed a way to generate more solutions of a string theory if a single solution was known. This method was quite general. Using this method, he constructed a solution that in included a string carrying an electrical current. This solution provided the evidence for the conjecture of Britton, Hull, and Townsend. In 1987, physicists Michael Dine, Nathan Seiberg, and Edward Britton argued that some string theories, if looked at from a four-dimensional point of view, can have a broken supersymmetry. This broken supersymmetry happens due to a term called Faya Iliopoulos D term, named after the French physicist Pierre Faya and Greek physicist John Iliopoulos. This term is generated by Feynman diagrams having one loop, with physicists Lance Dixon and Joseph attic, Sen did this one-loop calculation explicitly and showed that the d-term was there. However, Sen later showed that this d-term doesn't always break supersymmetry. We will come back to this story later. Sen did seminal work on establishing the validity of dualities in string theory. We covered this full story in the video on Edward Britton's work, so you can watch that video for the full story. I will just summarize the story here. People were finding some results that suggested that there might be some dualities connecting the regime where the force is weak to the regime where the force is strong. The technique jargon for these regimes is weak coupling and strong coupling. It is difficult to study physics for strong coupling because many of the methods that physicists have developed fail for strong coupling. However, many people were skeptical about these dualities and they thought that these results might just be consequences of supersymmetry. To counter these suspicions, Sen derived a consequence of dualities that could not be derived from supersymmetry. This consequence was about the way in which electric and magnetic charge is quantized. Duality symmetry also implied that there should be a bound state of two monopoles and in 1994, Sen proved that these bound states exist. This was a major result, and in 2014, Edward Britton said that this paper by Sen had a major role in changing his attitude towards duality. Sen's work on duality was very influential, and it contributed to getting him the S.S. Bhatnagar Prize in 1994, the Third World Academy of Sciences Award in 1997, the Breakthrough Prize in 2012, and the ICTP's Dirac Medal in 2014. It also contributed to getting him a fellowship of the Royal Society in 1998. The person who nominated him for a fellowship was none other than Stephen Hawking. 
In 1996, physicist Kumrun Wafa wrote a paper in which he studied new kinds of compactifications of type 2b string theory called the D-manifold compactifications. This started a whole new field called F-theory. F-theory can be thought of as a theory living in 12 dimensions. In these compactifications, the coupling was not always small and this implied that the normal methods won't work here. On top of that, Wafa argued that some compactifications of F-theory are related to more conventional compactifications of string theory. For example, the compactification of F-theory on a space called K3 is related to the compactification of heterotic theory on a two-dimensional torus which is also called T2. Sen showed that for some compactifications of F theory, you can take a limit where you can reduce them to conventional compactifications of string theories called orientifold compactifications. Using Sen's procedure, one could easily understand Wafa's dualities in terms of already known string dualities. This procedure was used by many people to find other F theory dualities. In a later paper, Sen showed that in the weak coupling limit, a general compactification of F theory on a particular kind of space called the Calabi-Yau manifold can be reduced to an orientifold compactification of type 2b string theory. In the early 1970s, physicist Stanley Mandelstam published two papers, which were the earliest papers on a new idea called second quantization of strings or string field theory. In 1974, physicists Michio Kaku and Kei Kakawa presented an explicit description of a string field theory in a series of two papers. However, Kaku and Kakawa's theory did not preserve manifest symmetry under Lorentz transformation. The technical jargon is that these theories were not covariant. Many physicists worked on finding covariant formulations of string field theory and they were successful in finding such theories. For example, Edward Witten gave the simplest example of such a theory which is now called Witten's cubic open string field theory. Now, it is widely believed that any theory of quantum gravity should have a property called background independence. It means that the fundamental equations of the theory should not depend on how the space-time looks like and what fields it contains. The technical jargon for the shape of space time and the fields that it contains is background. Sen tried to prove the background independence in string field theory. In the paper, he had partial success in this goal. However, in two later papers that he wrote with the physicist Barton Zubek, he was able to prove the background independence of string field theory for a class of backgrounds. In superstring theory, there are different sectors in which a theory can be. Sen, with another physicist named R. Saroja, showed that for one of these sectors, you can write down a string field theory consistently. However, in their work, they had moving points on a surface and if these points collided, it would be a problem. The technical jargon for these points is picture changing operators or PCOs. At that time, they couldn't show if this collision can be avoided. However, in a much later paper, Sen demonstrated how to deal with these possible collisions. In this paper, he used a concept called vertical integration, but a systematic procedure for carrying out the vertical integration was not presented. This procedure was developed by Sen and Witten in this paper. Recall that this string field theory that Sen and Saroja wrote down was for one sector. Sen later made progress on achieving this for other sectors as well. In this quest, Sen proved the important result that string field theories are unitary theories. Being a unitary theory is a necessary feature of any quantum theory. It just means that the total probability should always be one. Another set of works that contributed to getting Sen the Fellowship of the Royal Society and the Dirac Medal is his work on black holes. Sen has done a lot of work on the entropy of black holes. It is not an easy task to summarize his huge amount of work, but I will try my best. We talked about the solution generating method that Sen came up with. Using this method, Sen tried to find the four-dimensional black hole solutions in heterotic string theory. He found the most general, electrically charged, rotating black hole solution. Because these solutions are found in string theory, they are actually string states. These are called black hole solutions because they behave like black holes. Because of the work of Jacob Bekenstein and Stephen Hawking from the 1970s, physicists know that the black holes have an entropy. The formula for this entropy is called the Bekenstein-Hawking formula. In string theory, this formula gets a bit modified. Sen wanted to see if the entropy of black hole solutions coming out of string theory agrees with the modified Bekenstein-Hawking formula. However, it turned out that this calculation could not be done so easily unless you take special kinds of state called the BPS states. When Sen did this calculation, the entropy of black hole solutions almost matched the modified Hawking-Bekenstein formula. I say almost because there was a numerical factor that could not be calculated. After this calculation, some people tried to do a similar analysis for other types types of solutions. For example, this major breakthrough paper by Kumrun Wafa and Andrew Strominger. They could even calculate the numerical factor that was not available in Sen's analysis. The missing numerical factor in Sen's analysis was later calculated by physicist Atish Tapolkar. If a theory has a particular amount of supersymmetry which is called n equals 4 supersymmetry, then typically these theories contain particular states that have both electric and magnetic charges. These states are called dionic states. In 1996, physicists Robert Diagraph 
Eric Werlind and Hermann Werlind conjectured a formula that counts the number of such states for a given electric and magnetic charge. This formula is called the degeneracy formula because physicists often refer to the number of states as degeneracy. In their conjecture, they had a particular mathematical object called the Igusa cusp form. Note that this form appears in the denominator of the formula. In a series of papers, Sen, Dilip Jatkar, and Justin David worked out all the dionic states in a class of such theories and their degeneracy formulas. They noted that in all of these theories, the degeneracy formula had mathematical objects in them that belonged to a family called the Siegel modular forms. This work by Sen, Jatkar, and David was a generalization of the work by Digraph, Verlind, and Verlind. Now, there is a small point that will be relevant for this video later. In general relativity, if you have a state with two or more black holes, that state can't be stable because the black holes will attract each other and combine to make a single big black hole. However, in special theories called supergravity theories, sometimes you can have stable states with two or more black holes. These states are called multicentral black hole states. When we count black hole states in any theory, we have to ask ourselves if we are also counting these multicentral black hole states or just the single black hole states. For the analysis that we just talked about, Sen and his collaborators counted single black hole states and multicentral black hole states. This point will be important later. To talk about the next piece of work, we need to talk about Einstein's equation. Einstein's equation is the simplest equation that we can have for general relativity, but we can add corrections to this equation and study the resulting theory. These corrections obviously change the behavior of black holes and it also changes the formula for the black hole entropy. In 1993, Robert Wald calculated a general formula for black hole entropy that will be true even if we add corrections to Einstein's equation. However, Wald's analysis is quite difficult in general. If we have a black hole with an electrical charge, then it turns out that its mass can't be lower than a particular limit. This limit depends on the electrical charge of the black hole. If the mass of the black hole is equal to this limit, then the black hole is called an extremal black hole. For extremal black holes, Wall's analysis becomes much easier. Sen showed that for an extremal black hole, we can find the entropy of the black hole by maximizing a quantity called the entropy functional. This entropy does not depend on what happens far away from the black hole. In fancier words, the value of the entropy is attracted to a value that we get by maximizing the entropy functional. This is an example of what physicists call an attractor mechanism. A special thing about Sen's work was that he achieved the attractor mechanism without supersymmetry. Later, in a paper with Bindu Sarsahu and a paper with multiple collaborators, he generalized this analysis to rotating black holes. However, he didn't stop there. He proposed an exact quantum mechanical formula for the black hole entropy for an extremal black hole. This formula has all the corrections from quantum mechanics and all corrections from string theory. However, this analysis does not talk about multicentral black holes. This point will be very important later. Using this result, he derived the corrections to black hole entropy in n equals 2 supersymmetry and with some collaborators this was done for n equals 4 and n equals 8 supersymmetry. He even generalized this result to some black holes which are not extremal black holes. One such black hole is the good old Schwarzschild black hole which has no electrical charge and does not rotate. For the entropy of Schwarzschild black hole, Sen found that his result disagreed with the result of loop quantum gravity. As I said before, it is important to understand the relation between the degeneracy of a single black hole solution and multicentral black hole solutions. Sen worked out a solution to this problem as well. It was known that if you continuously change the parameters of the theory, then the degeneracy of multicentral black holes does not change. However, in the parameter space, there exist some walls that are called walls of marginal stability. If you change the parameters of the theory such that these walls are crossed, then the degeneracy of the multicentral black holes jumps from one value to another. Another. Sen classified these walls for a wide class of n equals 4 supersymmetric theories. In another paper, he calculated the amount by which the degeneracy jumps when these walls are crossed. This formula is called the wall crossing formula, but remember that this is only for n equals 4 supersymmetry. Some people tried to derive the wall crossing formula for n equals 2 supersymmetry. These include three pairs. The first pair is Greg Moore and Frederick Taniff. The second pair is Maxim Konsevich and Jan Soibelman. And the third pair is Dominic Choice and Yin and Song. With Jan Manshart and Boris Piolin, Sen derived two versions of the wall crossing formula. Later, Sen showed that the two formulas that he derived were consistent with the results that were derived by people mentioned before. Using the ideas developed in this line of work, Sen finally derived the relation between the degeneracy of single black hole solutions and the multicentral black hole solutions. Now, the approaches that counted just the single black hole solution and the approaches that also count the multicentral black hole states could be compared to each other. 
In string theory, people study objects on which the endpoints of the open string can end. These objects are called D-brains. The existence of these objects breaks some supersymmetry. Intuitively, we can see that the directions parallel to these membranes are not equivalent to the directions perpendicular to them. So these brains break some supersymmetry, but not all of it. These kinds of brains are also called BPS brains. To be precise, these brains also have to satisfy an inequality, but that is not relevant for our discussion. People had worked a lot on these BPS brains. Most notably, Physicist Joseph Polchinski wrote his famous paper on D-brains in 1995. Now, non-supersymmetric D-brains, which are also known as non-BPS D-brains, can also exist, but they are usually not stable. Sen wanted to study non-BPS brains which are stable. He also wanted to study what happens to these brains if they are not stable. For this discussion, we need to introduce the concept of an anti-brain. Every particle has an antiparticle and usually, the antiparticle is defined as the particle having the same mass but opposite electrical charge to the original particle. Similarly, D -brain brains can have anti-D brains as well. Suppose we put a D brain and an anti-D brain exactly on top of each other, but we will show them a bit separate so that we can distinguish them. Now, if there is an open string with one endpoint on D brain and one endpoint on anti-D brain, then it is possible for this open string to act as a tachyon. In other words, it has a tachyonic mode. Tachyons are hypothetical objects that travel faster than light and the square of their mass is negative. These properties are unphysical and that is why tachyons are undesirable. Sen wanted to know what happens when this tachyon mode is at its minimum energy. This situation is also called tachyon condensation. He came up with two conjectures. Firstly, he considered a situation where the D-brain in question is one-dimensional. This D-brain is also called a D-string. Tachyons can contribute negative energy to a system and the tension of the D-string contributes positive energy. Sen conjectured that these two energies must exactly cancel because otherwise we can have infinite energy. This is sometimes called Sen's first conjecture. He also conjectured a relation between tachyons living on a particular D-brain and another D-brain which has one dimension less than the original one. With physicists Barton Zubeck and Nicholas Moller, he found some evidence for this second conjecture. To prove his first conjecture, he wrote two papers where he made some progress. Later in a paper with Barton Zubeck and then in a paper with Barton Zubeck and Nathan Berkowitz, he made substantial progress towards finding the evidence for this first conjecture. This conjecture was proven at last by Martin Schnabel in this paper. Until now, this discussion was about static D-brains, which means that the question of how these D-brains, especially the unstable ones, evolve with time is not asked. In 2002, Sen worked on this question. Sen showed that unstable D-brains decay to a gas that becomes pressureless after a long time. Now, before the decay, we have open strings living on the D-brain, and when a D-brain decays, it produces closed strings. Based on some results, Sen formulated the conjecture that open strings that are present before the decay already know the properties of closed strings that the D-brain decays to. This conjecture is called open string completeness conjecture. When we are calculating the probabilities for certain string theory processes, to occur, we have to calculate the analog of Feynman diagrams for string theory. These Feynman diagrams are made using surfaces called Riemann surfaces and we have to do an integration to include all possible Riemann surfaces in the game. However, this integration can introduce some infinities. Many times, these infinities can be cured by some methods, but those methods don't always work. Recall that earlier in this video, I mentioned what on-shell means. People knew for some times that these infinities occur when a string in the middle of the diagram becomes on-shell. Sen, with Roji Pius and Arna Brudra, wrote two papers where they cured these infinities for a lot of states in bosonic string theory and superstring theory. Recall that I mentioned before that Sen worked on D terms and supersymmetry breaking. The work that he did with Pius and Rudra finally allowed him to show how the supersymmetry broken by D term can be restored for most cases. A similar kind of work that he did was his work on something called D instantons. D instantons can be thought of as point like D brains which live for just a moment of time. These instantons can show their effects in string scattering processes. In 1997, physicists Michael Green and Michael Gutperla studied the effects of these instantons in type 2b string theory. In a much later paper, Bruno Balthazar, Victor Rodriguez, and Xi Jin studied their effects in two-dimensional bosonic string theory. These papers had some open problems that needed to be solved. Sen came up with a strategy to analyze these d instanton contributions. He wrote four papers where he solved these problems for two-dimensional bosonic string 
string theory and two papers where he solved the open problems for type 2b string theory. In 1965, Steven Weinberg came up with a very important result called the soft graviton theorem. This theorem says that if you have some incoming particles and some outgoing particles, then the probability for this process to happen is related to the same process with an additional graviton added to either an incoming or outgoing particle. However, this additional graviton should have a very, very small energy and these gravitons are called soft gravitons. A similar result holds if we replace gravitons with photons. Now, because the energy of the gravitons is small, we can write the relationship between these two processes as a series in powers of the energy of the graviton. If Pg is the momentum of the graviton, then the result that Weinberg derived was the first order result. Much later, in 2014, physicists Andrew Strominger and Freddy Cachasso calculated the next term in this result, which is called the subleading term. In 2017, Sen extended their work and calculated the next term, which is called the sub-subleading term. The last work that I want to mention is about special types of models called matrix models. In 1996, physicist Leonard Susskind, Stephen Schenker, Tom Banks, and Willy Fischler showed that M-theory can be seen as the quantum mechanical theory of an infinitely big matrix. Their matrix model is now called the BFSS model. Sen extended their work to find a description of the BFSS model when some dimensions of M-theory are compactified. Sen worked on the case of weak coupling and showed that for this case, M-theory compactified on an n-dimensional torus can be thought of as point-like d-brains on an n-dimensional torus. These point-like d-brains are called d0 brains. There are many other works that Ashok Sen did, but I have made a comprehensive effort to talk about his most important works. In addition to the awards that I have already mentioned, Sen was also awarded Padma Shri in 2001 and Padma Bhushan in 2013. Both of these awards are Indian civilian awards. In the end, I would just say that I have huge respect for Dr. Ashok Sen as he is an inspiration for many physics students, especially from the Indian subcontinent, to pursue theoretical physics as a career. He's also a very good teacher and many students have benefited from his teaching. That makes him a great asset to physics students. If you have any questions or comments about this video, then let me know in the comments and I will see you in the next video.